Great to be with everybody tonight. Thank you for joining me. I'm thrilled to be talking about style of music, which it seems to me, if I were to, to hazard a guess, is probably a, a very popular genre with many listeners here tonight. We're talking, of course, about musical theater. Now to recap, we've been talking about, well, theatrical music in different centuries. We looked at music from the 18th century with the oratorios of, of George Frederick Handel. We talked about Handel's sojourning in London and his ascendancy there, his rise to, uh, to prominence and um, tremendous oratorios he wrote, such as Israel and Egypt and Messiah. Last week, we talked about 19th century opera. That's a genre that I think for many people represents the apogee, the apex, the zenith, the golden age of Italian opera, works by Verdi, works by Puccini, earlier in the century, Rossini, Donizetti, Bellini. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about a transition in the 20th century that takes theatrical music sort of out of the realm of opera and into the realm of a new form, which is closely related to opera, as we'll see tonight. At least that's the case with respect to Les Miserables. There's a lot to say about Les Mis, but before we get there, I wanna spend some time talking about some of the salient characteristics, some of the defining features that typify musical theater as opposed to opera. As we'll learn throughout the evening, this is a bit of a blurry issue, especially when it comes to certain pieces. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean when I talk about the nebulous or ambiguous or blurriness of this division between musical theater and opera. Some would point to the fact that in opera, a work is sung through straight. That is to say, there's no spoken dialogue. And then in a musical, there is spoken dialogue. And therefore, the difference is that in opera, you sing constantly and there's no spoken dialogue. But in a musical, um, there is spoken dialogue. But as we'll see tonight with Les Mis, that's not the case. Les Mis is sung straight through. And if we were to go back to 1791 and look at Mozart's magic flute, Die Zauberflöte, auf Deutsch, we would see that the magic flute has plenty of spoken dialogue. So yes, we could list that as a general uh, discrepancy between the two, but we'd have to put an asterisk and a footnote, would we not? All right, well, what are some other differences? Some might point to the instrumental accompaniment, that in an opera, you've got a full orchestra, which could be anywhere from 20 to 50, perhaps as many as 100, or in the case of Wagner, 150, maybe even 180 people playing in the orchestra. Well, you're not going to have 180 people playing in a musical theater pit. So that's, I think, a very valid uh, comparative point. We could also point to the fact that in a musical, you're going to get instruments that you would never get in an opera. For example, you're going to get electric keyboards, electric guitars, electric bass, drum set. Uh, you're not likely to find any of those in any opera that I can think of. Um, certainly not the typical rock configuration that you get in some musicals like Little Shop of Horrors or Next to Normal or any of those big rock musicals from the 70s like Hair or Hairspray or Pippin or Godspell and the list goes on. So therefore instrumentation is a big difference. I would suggest that an even bigger difference is what we'll generally refer to as vocal delivery and I think it can be summarized like this. In opera Often what we get is singers who can act. A great example would be some of the most famous opera singers in the canon, such as the three tenors, Luciano Pavarotti. We love Pavarotti. His legacy is, I think, uh, has enshrined him in the top of the canon of, of opera singers and interpreters of Italian opera especially. But nobody would say that Pavarotti is famous for his acting. He's famous for his voice. And in opera, that tends to be the case. That it's really about the singing and less so the acting. Although I should point out as a historical footnote that I think when historians look back on the evolution of opera, they will point to this exact period that we're living in, let's say the second decade and the third decade of the 21st century and see that there's a change there because with the advent of the Met in HD and HD productions, opera singers have been forced to acclimatize to the new status quo and to become essentially better actors. And therefore they take master classes and hire private coaches and, and work with professional actors to improve that side of their presentation. As far as the vocal delivery, well, I think a musical th a theater trained singer, a Broadway singer would think that 
an opera singer might sound a bit contrived. There's a lot of wobble to the voice, what we call vibrato. There's a lot of emphasis on diction in opera, rolling the R's, pronouncing very crisp consonants, making sure that the vowel placement is exactly correct. Um, and in linguistics, uh, from a linguistics perspective, you know, approaching diphthongs and schwa vowels. You see, when you study opera, you want to be a pro opera singer, you've got to take entire courses on this subject. Can you imagine? You've got to take, it's not just you have to learn German and Italian and French. You've got to take classes on how to pronounce these words. So for an opera singer, diction is paramount. And opera singers have to sing in, in various languages. Primarily, it should be emphasized in Italian. Well, what about musical theater? Do they take diction courses? Not really. They're mostly singing in English. And therefore, diction is not really as big an issue because the audience is not going to struggle to understand what you're saying. So that's a difference. In musical theater, the technique that's employed by the singer is what's called belting. And that means you might think of it as a sort of a chesty, throatier approach to singing. And this is familiar to anyone who's ever listened to a pop singer or a rock singer. Uh, they're not using what an opera singer would think of as proper technique. From an opera perspective, belting is almost a controlled shout, which is to say that there's a bit of a stigma on musical theater from the opera side. Conversely, from, from the Broadway side, they might think of operas being contrived and sort of very uh, stiff sounding with the rolled R's and the proper diction and the uh, use of extensive head voice for females. Girls in musical theater really don't sing in much head voice. There are some roles that require it. For example, if you're singing Glinda in, in Wicked, then you're gonna be singing some sky high notes that require head voice. But for the most part, these are belting roles which means that you're going to be employing that, again, that modal chest register, and it's going to be louder and more muscular sound than that which an opera singer would employ. So again, to summarize, in opera, there's a bigger emphasis on, uh, on diction and on singing in different languages and on going uh, up into the sky-high register of the high fifth and even into the sixth octave. And yes, um, someone mentioned in chat, uh, the role of Christine in Phantom of the Opera, uh, that's a role that requires you to sing into the sixth octave, above C6. So approaching the queen of the night, they're not quite as high. I think the high note there is an E6. Still, you're breathing rarefied air. For a typical female uh, leading role in musical theater, uh, the range could be much lower because you're not expected to sing it in head voice. You'd be expected to sing it in that, again, more muscular belting tone. So we, we've seen now that there are some differences in instrumentation differences in, um, in vocal delivery, we can call it that, the belting technique versus the head voice singing that we see in, um, in musical, uh, excuse me, the, the head voice technique which we see in opera. All right, let's talk about Les Mis. This is a work that sort of straddles the two worlds of opera and musical theater. If we wanted to talk about the early days in musical theater, we could go back to the 1930s, 1940s, and look at works by, for example, Cole Porter. We could look at works like Showboat. Uh, we could look at works from the 1950s. We'll talk a little bit about one of those works. It's Candide by Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein was the sort of, the, um, one of the most versatile musicians and one of the most iconic musicians in the 20th century. He was born in 1918 in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and he seemed to be able to do it all. A virtuoso pianist, he could sit down and play just about anything from memory. He could conduct, and he, of course, became one of the most famous and celebrated conductors in the world. He conducted the New York Philharmonic starting at a very young age, in his late 20s. He would later conduct ensembles such as the Israel Philharmonic, Berlin Philharmonic, Vienna Philharmonic, London Philharmonic. Well, if you're working with all those groups, then stands to reason that you'd be regarded as one of the best conductors, one of the most celebrated and iconic figures in, in conducting history of the 20th century. And there are many conductors now who are direct students of Bernstein. Marian Alsop is one such uh, figure, along with uh, Per Vojarvi, the Estonian conductor who is, is a hot ticket now in Europe. He works with some of the best orchestras in Europe. Um, these are students of Leonard Bernstein. And of course, Bernstein was uh, a noted composer as well. And while he wrote many works, including works like Prelude, Fugue, and Riffs for a jazz combo, 
and uh, he wrote uh, Mass and the Chichester Psalms for voice, voices with orchestra. I think it's fair to say that his best known works are those he wrote for musical theater. And there are four examples of that, I think. Four of his works have, have been enshrined in the canon. They are On the Town, Wonderful Town, and then the two better known ones would be Candide and then uh, West Side Story, which is certainly the most famous of the four. Bernstein uh, was classically trained, of course. He studied at Harvard, and then he did some, some post-bachelor uh, study at the Curtis Institute in Philadelphia. So this is a guy who's sort of weaned on Bach and Beethoven, if you will. And yet one of the things that made him so famous and I think so effective as an ambassador, uh, a musical ambassador, and some of you remember his pre-concert talks and young people concert lectures, is that he understood not just Bach and Beethoven, but he could talk with equal facility about the Beatles or the Rolling Stones. And um, I would say, suggest that this is an important factor in musical theater because in musical theater what we're going to get in some cases um, is the influence of pop genres and that would include rock to a tremendous degree starting in the 70s especially but other genres like jazz and as we'll see next week when we look at Hamilton hip-hop more on that later on but I wanted to mention Bernstein because he deserves uh, you know an honorable mention in tonight's program for being one of the composers who weaves between um, traditional opera and the nascent and inchoate genre of musical theater. For Bernstein, musical theater is, is in its primordial stages and he helps, I think, to really uh, codify the, uh, the characteristics of musical theater. And that leads us to the 1980s to Les Miserables. So let me show you what for many will be a very familiar photo. This is, um, the iconic image associated with Les Mis, the musical. This is the uh, portrait of the young Cosette. We're gonna talk about Cosette. She's sweeping the inn here where she works for a very corrupt and crooked family. She's kind of become the icon for Les Miserables, um, which sounds like it should be translated in, into English as the miserable ones. And often it is. Um, you might think of it instead as those who endure hardship. We'll talk about what, how that hardship manifests and who are the, the primary dramatis personae in this musical. And we'll listen to four or five excerpts, which demonstrate a principle which I'm gonna discuss, uh, which we'll broadly refer to as musical characterization, or might be thought of as leitmotif composition. And I'll talk a lot about that tonight. Little, uh, this, um, Little Cosette is uh, only in the musical for, uh, for a little bit. She spends most of the, uh, the musical as, you know, adolescent grown-up Cosette, about 17 or 18 years old. And nonetheless, this image has endured as the sort of representative image for the musical. The show dates from the early 1980s. It's based on a, a book by, by Victor Hugo, or as we know him, Victor Hugo, the um, French writer of the 19th century, French romanticist, poet, and author. It was turned into a, a concept album first and then became a musical in, in French. And in 1985 was translated by uh, Herbert Kretzmar with music by, by uh, Claude Michel Schomburg and it was premiered in London's West End Theatre. And that was in 1985, and it's still running today. It is the second longest running show in history after a 1960s show, which, which is called The Fantastics. It's also one of the highest grossing shows. There is a kind of economic or fiscal element to musical theatre, which is not discussed too often, but uh, for those who are wondering, uh, some of the most financially successful musicals in history are shows that are not necessarily regarded as the best shows. For example, Phantom of the Opera was mentioned. You know, Andrew Lloyd Webber has, has had some big hits, but is Phantom the, you know, my favorite musical, if I can editorialize? Not really. I think there are great moments in Phantom. I think there are compelling numbers, but on balance, I don't think it packs the same punch as uh, some of the more expressive works of the 20th century and 21st century even, uh, works like Ragtime or Next to Normal or um, Dear Evan Hansen, I think is a very successful work. Uh, Hades Town, which is a very recent Tony winner from 2019 is a great work. 
Um, but, but nonetheless, people buy tickets to go see Phantom of the Opera. People buy tickets to go see Cats. And uh, I won't tell you my opinion on Cats, although I'm sure some of you can guess. Uh, I have some students who are devotees of the show. And uh, I'll say this about Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, I prefer Starlight Express to Cats. And Starlight Express is a musical where the characters are all on roller skates and they're roller skating around the theater, weaving in and out of the uh, seating area, the audience where the audience is seated. So, all right, enough about that. Let's, uh, let's get back to Les Mis. We talked about the, um, the evolution of musical theater. What can we expect in Les Mis? Well, actually, this is closer to opera than some of the musicals I mentioned uh, just now. How is it close to opera? Well, the vocal delivery is variable. That depends on the actor who's cast in the role. You might get someone who's more operatically trained or you might someone who's got more of a pop Broadway voice. As far as the orchestration goes, this is actually a pretty big pit. There's two horn players. There's a trombone player who doubles on tuba. There's, I think, three or four reed parts. So that would be, for example, instruments like oboe or clarinet. Uh, there's two keyboards. And then, of course, you've got drums, bass, uh, guitar, etc. So it's a pretty big pit, bigger than the average musical, for sure. It's got a huge cast. In fact, there's a ton of named characters uh, some of who are, are important and others of who are of ancillary interest to us. We're going to focus on about five characters. So let's get into it. The main character here is Jean Valjean. Some of you may be familiar with the role of Valjean because it was famously portrayed by Hugh Jackman in the 2012 film adaptation of this uh, musical. If you're wondering what does Professor Gill think of the film adaptation, the answer is, actually, I thought it was pretty good. I know some of the critics really uh, slammed it. Some of the critics were biting in their, scathing in their criticism. And um, a lot of what they complained about didn't bother me. For example, some people complained that Hugh Jackman as Valjean, he's not really a tenor, he's more of a baritone, maybe a high baritone. But the role of Valjean is a tenor role. So they had to kind of rewrite his music and transpose it down, some of it, transpose as many as three semitones or what's called a minor third. That didn't bother me at all. You know, it's, I think Jackman's a good actor and I give him a lot of credit. I think as far as Broadway A-listers go, he's got a great voice, he really does. You know, the people who say, well, he's not a trained Broadway star. Uh, that's not true, actually. He's got a lot of experience on stage and I think he's a fine singer. Um, I thought that the other uh, primary cast members were very good too. I thought Amanda Zayfried was not bad. I thought that um, our, our neighbor here in Fairfield County, Anne Hathaway, um, uh, who I, I've heard, uh, I think I bumped into her once in Westport and I've heard she, she lives around here. I don't know if that's true. Anyway, um, I thought Anne Hathaway was very good. Of course, the, the anchor who dragged the show down was Russell Crowe. He was, it must be said, I like Russell Crowe as an actor, but his performance as the Inspector Javert was atrocious. Um, well, maybe that's being extreme. Atrocious at times, passable at best. Uh, but, you know, the role of Javert is a tough role. You've got to have a nice, steady baritone voice that dips down into the lower register, be able to sing a nice, clean low F and go up two octaves above that. And Crow simply didn't have the notes. You know, he doesn't even try to sing some of the notes. He just kind of speaks through it. And if I want to hear Sprachstimme, I'll listen to Arnold Schoenberg. I don't need to listen to Russell Crowe, uh, you know, portray Inspector Javert. Javert is one of the most interesting characters. He's got some of the most interesting music. All right, let's get to the music. This is a massive score. There's actually, if you can believe it, uh, over 400 pages in the conductor score. So there's a lot going on here. We're going to have time to listen to about four or five excerpts from Act One. Let's set the stage for this musical. This musical bears uh, something in common with Hamilton, which is that they're both retellings of real episodes in history. So while Hamilton chronicles the late 18th century, the early 19th, the, the rise of Alexander Hamilton, uh, the Revolutionary War, the formation of the American government and banking system, uh, this musical chronicles the 1830s, the early 1830s in France. France had been through a period of tremendous tumult and chaos 
starting with the storming of the Bastille in the summer of 1789, then uh, the reign of Robespierre, the, what's called the reign of terror, then Napoleon and the establishment of the Republic, the abolition of the Republic in favor of an empire, um, and then Napoleon's defeat. It goes on in a period of, of uh, relative instability. And of course, we know who suffers in these periods of instability. It's the, the small folk, the commoners, if you will. In 1832, there was a real life figure by the name of General Jacques Lamarck. And Lamarck was thought of as the champion of the lower class. He was thought of as the, you might say, the bleeding heart progressive who um, advocated on behalf of those who did not have a voice, who did not have agency, and often who did not have bread. In 1832, this guy died, and it led to a very short and bloody and unsuccessful revolution of sorts that was initiated by some young revolutionary student types in Paris who saw Lamarck's death as an opportunity to overthrow the system, and of course, they were squashed like a bug against the windshield. So taken on balance, if we zoom out, this is a musical about a failed revolution about the characters who get swept up in it. But it's really a character uh, drama more than it is about politics. Let's start with the character of Valjean. When we meet Valjean at the beginning of the show, he is um, receiving his parole papers. He's being discharged from, from incarceration where he's been for 19 years. Why has he been in prison? Because he stole a loaf of bread. That's what he did. He stole a loaf of bread. And he was sentenced to five years. He was given subsequent sentencing for trying to escape. In the, in the beginning, he meets, uh, or we meet, his uh, tormentor. His name is Inspector Javert. So again, the hero of the story is Valjean, and the antagonist is Javert. Valjean is a tenor, Javert is a base. Valjean is uh, held in such contempt by Javert that he doesn't even get a name. Javert comes off as a almost a a zealot, a lunatic, a crusader for justice who believes in a kind of iron bound law. Um, he believes that all, all criminals are malfeasant and evil and therefore incapable of redemption. And he has such contempt for the criminals that he doesn't even refer to Valjean by his name. He refers to him exclusively by his prisoner ID, which is tattooed on his chest, 24601. And that's how he refers to him throughout the show. He calls him prisoner 24601. And we'll hear that set to music a little bit later. When the musical starts, Valjean violates his parole and becomes uh, essentially a criminal once again. But he's saved by the intercession of a very um, benevolent man who's the Bishop of Digne. And the Bishop, even though Valjean steals some silver and tries to make off like a thief, the bishop saves him when he's caught. And he says that he gave Valjean the silver. And he tells Valjean that something that's going to set up the rest of the, uh, the musical. He's going to say, use this opportunity to turn your life to good deeds. And that's what Valjean is going to do. We meet him sometime later. He is now the, um, he's taken on a, a new name and a new identity. He's living in a new town. He's become very successful. In fact, he's the mayor of that town, if you can believe it. And he owns and runs a big factory which employs hundreds of workers. One of those workers is a young girl named Fantine. And she's the first tragic, truly tragic figure we meet. Fantine is a single mother. We're gonna find out all about that in the first number. Her life, which was once full of promise and full of joy and full of, um, of idealistic optimism, is now a living hell. She works in the factory where, which Valjean owns, but she's sort of sexually um, you know, come on to by the foreman. She rejects him and so she is fired. So she works these long hours in the factory just to feed her daughter. Her daughter was born out of wedlock and uh, she's a, a single mother and she doesn't even get to see her daughter because she slaves away in the factory. And uh, then she gets fired from the factory for, for refusing the advances of the foreman. So life really can't get any worse for her. And we catch up with her tonight as she sings her first uh, an important number. It's called I Dreamed a Dream. I'm going to show you the score and uh, talk you through some of the important musical traits in the score. 
So here we have, I dreamed a dream. And here's Fantine sort of ruminating on how life has spiraled into the abyss for her. And um, what we see here is we open with a little bit of a recitative, but we're gonna pick up where the, the song starts in earnest. And here's what to look for. In music, we have melodies and bass lines. The bass line is what really drives this. So do you see how it descends? E flat, D, C, G, A flat, B flat, E flat, D, C, B flat, A flat, G. It's really a descending bass line. You see the downward contour of it? And every time it cadences back to E flat, it begins to descend once again. The role of Fantine, like most musical theater roles, requires the female singer to descend to a low register. So you'll see she has to go down to A and, and even here to low G flat. You can see the ledger lines here. So it can, it can get quite throaty for the female. It only goes up to a C, which is kind of an alto note, but because she's using that belting technique, um, it's going to have a more muscular sound to it. Note the lyrics here, because that's how we're going to absorb a lot of the plot. And note this theme, which is gonna come back more than once throughout the musical. It's very Wagnerian in a way, using a recurring musical motif to remind the audience of a particular character. Fantine is not gonna be around um, for much of the musical. She's gonna die fairly early in act one. And um, even though she dies, her music is gonna come back quite a bit. So here is, I dreamed a dream from Les Miserables. Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. Well, that certainly resonates with the title of the show, right? Les Miserables, the, the miserable ones or the downtrodden ones. Um, Fantine certainly checks that box, does she not? Well, she's going to get ill and die. That's sort of a stock device when it comes to 19th century period dramas. We saw that last week with Violetta dying at the end of La Traviata of consumption. Uh, it's again, a, a fairly typical uh, trope to encounter in a musical or for an opera in that mat for that matter. Well, Valjean is going to bear witness to the death of Fantine and it's going to uh, affect him dramatically because it's going to cause him to ruminate and meditate and reflect on the words of the bishop who saved his life and who encouraged him to use this opportunity to live his life for good. Now remember, at this point in the drama, Valjean is a powerful man. He's a mayor of a town. He has a factory with hundreds of workers. So uh, what do you, um, you know, what can we suppose he's going to do at this point? And the answer is uh, he's going to do, make a very selfless decision right now. And that's here in the next scene we're going to look at. Valjean, remember, he broke his parole. So even though he escaped from Javert, Javert is still hunting him. Now Javert catches up and he comes to the town and he sees a man that looks an awful like, a lot like Valjean. Now Valjean is sort of wondering to himself, okay, if I let this fanatical inspector Javert arrest the man that looks like me, I'm free forever, right? That's my ticket to freedom. But if I do that, then that's a, a really awful move to make because I'm condemning an innocent man. And he says as much, he asks himself a rhetorical question. He says, if I speak, I am condemned. In other words, if I go out and say, it's not him, I'm the one you're looking for, I'm gonna be condemned, hang maybe. But if I stay silent, I'm damned. In other words, my soul is gonna be that which suffers rather than my body. So he's got this uh, decision to make and what he's going to do is he's going to make his way over to the, um, to the court. He's gonna to go to the court of the town and he's gonna rip his shirt open in most productions and announce that he's Valjean. It's a short number, no more than two and a half minutes long. In the beginning half, there's a kind of ambiguous sense of tonality. As a listener, we're not quite sure what key it's in. It's constantly changing keys because of course, Valjean has not yet made up his mind. And as he's making up his mind, he's going to have to decide whether he's going to announce himself or whether he's going to uh, you know, condemn this innocent man to take the fall in his place. All right, what's the, uh, the significant moment here? Let me show you in the score. In the score, Valjean is going to sing uh, 
about, he's going to sing in this kind of recitative style. He thinks that man is me. He's talking about Javert here. I'm really interested in this part right here. You see, we have a key change to five sharps. We're in B major here, and we get this gentle descending pattern here. Ya da da da, ya da da da, ya da da da, ya. And it repeats, even though the bass notes are changing. Now, what do you notice about the bass line here? You don't have to be able to read music to see it. You see how it is descending by step? Starting on B, A sharp, G sharp, F sharp, E, D sharp, C sharp. It's the same exact bass line that we got, albeit at a, with a slightly different rhythm and a totally different pattern on top. This is really the uh, descending bass line that we just heard in I Dreamed a Dream. The most uh, certainly uh, salient and attention grabbing part here is at the end when he sings, I'm who am I? And he announces it to the court, I'm prisoner 24601. Those of you who read a little bit of music or sing will see this high B and think, golly, that's a high note. And it is. Uh, for singers who sing Valjean, this is the highest note in the show. It's written as a quarter note, which means a kind of short duration note, but it actually should be sustained. And um, it really shouldn't be sung in falsetto or head voice. So the man singing this shouldn't flip up into his head voice, but rather should you know, use that more muscular um, belting approach that we talked about. And not everybody can do it. It's a very hard note to hit. And, and the thing about tenors, you know, if a bass misses a low note, who cares? You know, who's even gonna hear it? But if a tenor misses a high note, I would make the case that for tenors are, are sort of the most vulnerable voice type, that it's really, you know, if you flub those notes, it can be very embarrassing. You can, you know, it's, your voice can crack um, and it can be humiliating and really shake your confidence. And I had a singer last year, very, very good, talented tenor student who uh, I said, well, what do you think about singing Who Am I? At the, we did a, a musical review of, of uh, Les Mis and he said, uh, yeah, I'll try it. And we did it in rehearsal and he was terrific. He, he hit it every time in rehearsal. And then we got to showtime and I knew it. I was accompanying and I, I heard him mistime his breathing. I, I, something about it, he just didn't take the right breath. And, when you're a choral director, you kind of hear these things. And of course he went up for the high note and didn't quite make it. And it shook his confidence and he didn't even try for the uh, subsequent showings. So it, this is an intimidating note, certainly for any tenor um, who's aspiring to sing musical theater. If you can sing this number, you can sing just about anything. All right, let's listen to Valjean announce his identity to the court and therefore uh, condemn himself to being arrested by Inspector Javert, the fanatic. All right, here is, this is a little bit later on, and it's called Who Am I? I am dead. Quick pause before we get into the next section. Did you notice the ambiguous sense of tonality here, how the chords sound very unsettled? Well, because Valjean hasn't answered the question yet. You know, he's asking himself essentially questions that point to the core of who he is. And, you know, how many sort of get out of jail free card here, but Valjean is, uh, we know from the music, is going to be uh, announcing his identity. Notice the descending bass line here. Listen for it as we continue. Bam, ba -dum, ba -dum. Let's listen to that. I'm going to rewind it just about 10 seconds and listen for the callback to uh, Fantine's melody that we heard just a little while ago. For those who are wondering, Hugh Jackman did not attempt to, uh, to sing that note, by the way. He went, you know, he still sang it in a reasonably high key. I think he sang a G sharp at the end. So good for Hugh Jackman. But uh, like I said, when you can sing that high B, you're breathing rarefied air. And um, in musical theater, that's a fairly rare note to come across. So um, it's more in the realm of opera. We talked about uh, the high Bs last week when Alfredo has to sing uh, Libiamo in the beginning of La Traviata. Okay. Well, Valjean has just announced himself to the court, but there's one complicating factor. Rather than simply turn himself in, he has a mission to fulfill before he can do that. We talked about Valjean, we talked about Fantine, we talked about Javert. I mentioned that Fantine has a daughter. In fact, I showed you the poster 
of Les Mis, which features the, uh, the face of the young Cosette. Cosette, because she is, uh, her mother works in a factory all day, has been raised by these corrupt and rapacious innkeepers known as the Tenardiers. They're real scumbags and scoundrels. We'll talk a little bit more about them later in the program. But poor Cosette is swept up in the tragedy of her mother's death. Now she's an orphan. Well, Valjean is going to make good because he didn't protect Fantine. He's going to make good um, on, on his, um, his promise to her as she was dying. And he's going to uh, sort of adopt Cosette and look after and take care of her. So he goes to the corrupt Thenardier family. He buys um, Cosette from them. They, they claim she has exorbitant medical costs and they extort him for a tremendous sum of money. He hands over all his money so that he can rescue the girl. And just as he's going to make his escape, who does he run into? Well, some of you know where this is going. He runs into Inspector Javert. So for us, this is uh, gonna be the first time we hear Javert sing tonight. Actually, it's a duet between Valjean and Javert. And in the duet, their stances are, are very, uh, here's my daughter, I don't know if anyone hears my daughter screaming right now. <laughs> mama, mama. Well, um, in the duet, Valjean basically says the following. He says, Inspector Javert, I, all I need is three days to make sure that this young girl, this young orphan is taken care of. She has no one else in the world. I have to do this. This is the right thing to do. And I have to do it. I need three days and then I'll turn myself in. Now Javert is perplexed by this. Remember I told you he's a fanatic. Javert can't understand a world in which um, a criminal would act selflessly. And Valjean has already done so by sparing the innocent soul who resembled him and announcing his identity to the court. Uh, now he claims that he needs three days to see that Cosette is taken care of, after which he will turn himself in and face whatever the consequences are of his, his uh, crime. Javert can uh, imagine a world that, that uh, works that way, in which criminals are, are capable of redemption. In fact, by the end of the musical, Valjean is going to uh, prove to, to Javert that criminals are capable of redemption. And Javert is so mystified and thunderstruck by this that he's actually gonna commit suicide at the end. He's gonna be so overwhelmed. He can't reconcile himself to a world where, uh, where these two things exist. Okay. This is called Confrontation. And in this number, let me just show you a little bit in the score of what to expect. And then I'll get to some questions in chat. Javert catches up with him and notice he sings Valjean at last. Remember, he recognizes him from the very beginning, even though time has passed and they've traveled, they both traveled a tremendous distance, their fates have brought them together. He mocks him, Monsieur le Maire. Remember, Valjean has risen high under this pseudonym. He wears the chain of office. Javert promises him, soon you'll wear a different chain. And take a look at the note he has to descend to, down to the low F. The singer who sings Valjean has to go quite low. And uh, again, uh, poor Russell Crowe just, you know, could not hit that note. He couldn't hit the high notes either. Valjean interrupts him. Before you say another word, Javert, listen to me. There is something I must do. And then he gets into talking about how he needs three days to save Cosette. And if he's allowed those three days, then uh, he will come back and turn himself in. Javert can't reconcile himself to a world in which that's possible. Pay close attention because at some point in the duet, they will start singing at the same time, but they have completely different text. Now here's an instance where having the score is tremendously advantageous. If you didn't have a score, how could you possibly hear what both characters are singing? Again, they are singing at the same time with completely separate texts. So therefore, um, this is a pretty tough thing to hear without a score, but we'll have the score, which will help us understand. So we we'll listen to this, then we'll take some questions before we listen to our final uh, example. All right, everyone sees the score. Let's go on and I will play confrontation. We can see here reading the, uh, the stage directions that Javert is gonna knock, uh, get knocked out by Valjean. Valjean in the musical is described as having sort of superhuman strength. Uh, notice the return of Fantine's music here. The I Dreamed a Dream music comes back and they sing sort of tenderly, but of completely different things. 
Javert is singing to Valjean. He says, wherever you go, you hide away. I swear to you, I'll be there to find you. And of course, Valjean, JV means Jean Valjean. Uh, he says, I swear I will be there. But he's talking to the little orphan girl, Cosette. So they sing finally at the end. They have the same words, but they are talking about completely different things. And um, that's how it ends. So uh, the singers there, Colm Wilkinson on the part of uh, Jacques, uh, excuse me, Valjean and Javert sung by Leo Burmeister. This is the original Broadway cast from 1987. Um, and you probably noticed at this point that some of the singers have you know, a different vocal approach than others. For example, uh, Randy Graff, who sang on this recording in the role of Fantine, on some of those high notes, she's really kind of, you know, an opera singer would say she's stringing. I don't think that's what's going on. She's just using, you know, a very uh, pop-oriented belt technique, which for a musical theater audience is very expressive, perhaps. All right, some uh, questions here. Uh, would be interesting to know who the singer is. Yeah, okay, so uh, Colm Wilkinson, yep, that was, he's got a very distinct voice. He sings a little bit like this uh, on the role of Valjean. Um, and yeah, you mentioned Alfie Bo. Barbara mentions Alfie Bo, who was uh, tremendous in the role of, um, of Valjean, but he's got a different background, different training. I'm not sure exactly what Colm Wilkinson's training is, but there are, you know, Les Mis is a rare musical where you do get classically trained opera singers in some productions. Um, another comment uh, in chat here, Russell Crowe uh, was not great with singing, but as, uh, as far as portraying as a, a zealous lunatic, uh, it was well done. Yeah, I agree. Now, Russell Crowe's a tremendous actor. Um, you know, I think he's, I don't know how many uh, awards, Academy Awards he's won, but I think he's won at least a few. And um, he's a very capable actor, but you know, if, if you want to act, go do movies um, that are not musical adaptations, I guess. All right, we come now to our last uh, excerpt of the evening and it's by far the most um, intricate one. So let me show you what's going on in this last number we're gonna listen to, it's called One Day More. At this point in the drama, you know, Valjean is still a fugitive from the law, Javert is still chasing him, but we've actually met a slew of new characters. So let me tell you about them. Uh, we've met the student revolutionaries, and I mentioned, I alluded to some of these before. Let me give you some of their names. The leader of this student revolutionary group is named Ajoura, and he sings sort of blustering, loud, and high-pitched music because, well, he's the leader calling everyone else to revolution, to arms, brothers. Again, this is a very ill-fated revolution. They are going to be uh, summarily crushed within a day. Um, other characters here, we meet the young student Marius. Marius is, um, he's a student who has a particular role in the musical. At this point in the drama, we're about 10 years later after we just ended with confrontation. So Valjean has escaped with the young Cosette and raised her. She's now about 17, beautiful to behold. And when he brings her um, to Paris, she, um, falls in love with Marius and he falls in love with her. Sort of love at first sight, you might say. But there's a, a third uh, person in this love triangle and that's Eponine. Eponine is the daughter of that corrupt family, the Thenardiers. So we have their daughter Eponine, their sort of foster daughter for the first seven or eight years of her life, Cosette. Now they're both young women who are you know 17 or so, vying for the affection of the same man. And that man, of course, is young Marius. So General Lamarck has died and the students are calling for a revolution and they're going to arm themselves and man the barricades and, um, and challenge the, uh, the authorities in this uh, would-be revolution. Now, let me show you what's going on in the text and we can sort of follow along with what's happening. Does anybody recognize this descending? Ostinato pattern. Ostinato means a repeating pattern of four notes. This descending pattern. Take a look at the bass note up in the treble clef. A, G sharp, F sharp, E, D, C sharp, B, E. And then it repeats. A, G sharp, F sharp, E, D, D, C sharp, E, E. So we have that descending bass line exactly as we've heard it in a number of examples tonight. We first heard it in I Dreamed a Dream. We have this pattern here, which is, it's in A major, 
but the F sharp is in the pattern and that's gonna make it a little bit more ambiguous. It won't sound like a clear A major because it's got the sixth scale degree. All right, music theory aside, who's singing? Valjean starts with the theme as Colm Wilkinson uh, uh, in inhibitably uh, sings it here. One day more, another day, another destiny. Um, you know, what's he talking about? Well, he's looking ahead to the revolution on the horizon, this never ending road to Calvary. Calvary, of course, being the place where, where Jesus was crucified on the plain of Golgotha, the place of the skull. These men who seem to know my crime will surely come a second time. He's talking about Javert, the inspector is, is still hunting him. As Valjean sings, Marius comes in with his theme. Remember, Marius is the young uh, student who is loved by both Cosette and Eponine, but only reciprocates that love towards Cosette. And the composer is gonna tell us that in a moment, you'll see. I didn't live till today. In other words, I didn't live until I knew what love is and I didn't love until today. How can I live if I'm parted from my love? Now Cosette sings with him in parallel. Tomorrow you'll be worlds away. In other words, she's being sent off to safety by her uh, foster father, Valjean. And Marius is going to be manning the barricades with his student buddies. Eponine is alone. She loves Marius, but he doesn't love her back. He regards, he, you know, as a latter generation would say, she's in the friend zone. So she sings one more day on my own. Marius and Cosette always sing together because they're a couple. Eponine has been rejected, spurned by Marius. Therefore, she sings alone. Later, actually, in act two, she's gonna sing a famous song called On My Own. We change keys here at letter C and Anjol Ra comes in with the blustering high G, one more day before the storm at the barricades of freedom. Marius contemplates, should I join my brothers at the barricade and fight, perhaps facing certain doom? Do I stay or do I dare? Will you take your place with me, Anjola says as we cadence to E flat and the key changes once again. The time is now, the day is here. This is the students, the revolutionaries are singing. We go from E flat to a dominant seven chord on E and look at Valjean once again on the high note, he's gonna come in way up on the high A, one day more. And now look who sings. The fanatic, zealous, and somewhat psychotic Inspector Javert. Let's look at what his plan is. One more day till revolution. We, being the government authorities, are gonna nip it in the bud. We'll be ready for these schoolboys. They will wet themselves with blood. Valjean at this point is only singing basically one line. He's just gonna pop in to sing one day more. And it's always on this one day more or sometimes on a high sustain note. Now look who sings, the Thenardiers. Remember I mentioned them, the corrupt innkeepers? Well, they're excited about this you know, would-be revolution because they smell blood in the air and they're essentially excited about moving corpses. Here a little dip, there a little touch. Most of them are goners, so they won't miss much. In other words, they're, they're excited to loot the corpses. Um, by the time we get to the end, you wait till you see how many people are singing here. Valjean is singing these you know, high sustain, one day more on the top G. Marius and Cosette are singing uh, their earlier words about about being worlds away. Eponine is singing about being on her own. Javert is singing about infiltrating uh, the students to ensure their downfall. So you can see from the score, there's an unbelievable amount of simultaneity. The Thenardiers are singing about looting the corpses. And then finally, everybody comes together. Tomorrow we'll see what our God in heaven has in store. One more dawn, one more day, one day more. And you can see some operatic tones here from Cosette has to go up to this C in the sixth octave. Uh, so that's the highest note in the opera for her and for anyone for that matter. No one else is singing above C6 in the show. All right, let's uh, listen to One Day More. And we'll um, get to follow along. Again, here the score is so useful because once everyone starts singing, it becomes quite difficult to hear the individual words if you don't have a libretto or a score in front of you. Here is the end of act one, the number that ends the first act of the show. Well, it's not the end of the uh, musical. This is just the end of act one. Uh, spoiler alert, almost everyone's gonna die in act two. Um, 
Eponine, who we just met, she remembers, you might think of her as the spurned lover, the one who, who loves Marius, but it's not reciprocated. Eponine is going to be shot running towards the barricade. Um, Marius is going to be shot, but he will be rescued by Valjean and carried through the sewers. And, and, um, and ultimately, he'll recover. And with Valjean's blessing, he's going to marry Cosette. Uh, they have one of the, the most uh, tender duets in the canon, I think, A Heart Full of Love in Act Two. Um, we meet uh, again with Inspector Javert. Uh, he catches up with Valjean a few more times, but when he realizes that Valjean is, is this, you know, actually a, a very scrupulous and benevolent character, um, it shakes his faith. Valjean, is, uh, I should say, uh, Javert is kind of a religious fanatic, and that's not so clear. He says in confrontation, you know, I am from the gutter too. I was born like, with scum like you which might explain his contempt for, for criminals. Um, but later in Stars, his solo number in Act One, he sings things like, you know, and if they should fall as Lucifer fell, the flame, the sword, uh, talking about the divine punishment that waits in store for people who, um, whom he's seeking to arrest. So he's kind of a religious fanatic. And um, the fact that he can't reconcile himself to a world in which a man like Jean Valjean exists, uh, an incarcerated and convicted criminal who's actually an incredibly uh, benevolent and giving and selfless human, um, he's going to throw himself in the Seine River in Paris and he's going to kill himself. And he gets a very expressive um, send off with a number which is unsurprisingly called Javert's Suicide. Ultimately, uh, the Musical ends with Valjean passing away. And as he passes away, Fantine comes back and um, essentially, you know, welcomes him to the other side and thanks him for spending his life and devoting his, his efforts and his industry to giving her daughter, Cosette, remember that's that the figure that's on the poster of the of Les Miserables, um, where she's just a young child wearing a, what looks like a, you know, a, a handkerchief on her head and she's sweeping me in. Um, ultimately, uh, Cosette and Marius are really the only um, two that make out at the end of the story. Even then, you know, the scars of the past, the, the grief of, of the conflict is gonna weigh heavily on them. And Marius gets to sing one of the most expressive numbers in the show. It's called Empty Chairs at Empty Tables. And it features him sort of returning to the old haunt where all of the students used to hang out before their failed revolution. And as he sings in that number, um, it, how all those chairs are empty because everyone is dead. It's just him left. So this is a, a story that's about revolution. It's about you know politics and this tumultuous political period. Um, but most of all, it's about relationships and it's about redemption. And Valjean is the ultimate redemption story. And the death of Inspector Javert um, is sort of the natural consequence of living one's life according to a code which is so rigid that you can't uh, imagine that you're wrong. And his contempt for, uh, for Valjean is, is evident from the first moment. He says it in the first song. He says, come with me, prisoner 24601. Um, by the end of the story, the redemption of Valjean is complete. And that means that Javert, his sort of antithesis, his polar opposite, is going to wind up in the drink, so to speak. He's going to wind up drowning himself in uh, the Seine River. So uh, redemption, love, relationships, politics, this is at the core of, uh, of Les Miserables. And I would make the case that it's also at the core of the, the opera, not the opera, excuse me, the musical we're gonna look at next week when we turn our attention towards Hamilton. So Hamilton is a musical that uh, dates from the second decade of the 21st century it won the Tony for Best Musical in 2016, and it's been nothing short of a phenomenon nationally and even internationally. Uh, I often wonder, what does an English audience think when they're watching this show, which tells the story of the American Revolution, where the British are the bad guys, and the, um, there are characters like Samuel Seabury, who's an American British sympathizer. Well, he's depicted as a kind of a buffoon. And the ultimate buffoon in the show is um, King George III, who sings three times, and he's the comic relief character. So this is an international phenomenon. I wonder, it's very popular in London. It had many consecutive showings uh, leading into March of this year. 
And uh, we'll talk about the different characters, Hamilton and Marquis de Lafayette, who doubles as Thomas Jefferson in the second act, John Lawrence, who doubles as, as Philip Hamilton in the second act, Eliza Hamilton, her sister Angelica Schuyler. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of characters in, uh, in Hamilton. Those of you who are more familiar with musical theater may be more familiar with it. If you've got access to Disney Plus, you can go ahead and watch it to prepare for next week. If you love American history and if you've read Ron Chernow's biography of Hamilton, uh, then uh, you'll perhaps know the story. If you uh, have a chance and you haven't read the, the biography, I would strongly recommend it. Head over to a library and, uh, and go ahead and, and read the journal biography. It's long, it's, uh, it's not ponderous. It's not, uh, I think it's a very quick read as far as you know, long books that are close to a thousand pages go. But um, you know, I'm not suggesting read it for next week, but if you wanna prepare for next week's program, uh, you can go ahead and check out the plot of Hamilton. Of course, I encourage everybody to read a synopsis as well. We're gonna have time to look at five or six numbers just from act one. So we'll start with the opener, which is called Alexander Hamilton, and we'll end next week with nonstop, which uh, tell, sort of sets the, uh, the stage for uh, act two, which is going to be all about politics and the formation of government and the establishment of the bank. And you might ask yourself, Gil, is that, you know, is it possible to make that into compelling theater? The answer is obviously, I think a better question is how? How does a composer take this material, some of which can read like dusty history and turn it into com a compelling theatrical presentation? Well, that's going to be front and center next week when we're talking about the musical idiom of rap and hip hop and how it's woven into traditional musical theater. And then, um, uh, you know, turned into an international phenomenon. We'll talk about the far-reaching uh, appeal of Hamilton. We'll have to wait for next one. So tune in next week at seven o'clock Eastern time, seven o'clock. Uh, we'll have a link, a link from the Darien Library. Thank you to the Darien Library for making these programs possible, for making it, you know, feasible for us to get together despite uh, the current circumstances, which necessitate that we not gather live in person. I think that um, it's uh, entirely uh, plausible that these programs will continue even after the dust and settles and the smoke clears from the initial, uh, you know, this, this COVID pandemic. And uh, personally, I think they're wonderful. Uh, so thank you for the Darien Library for pioneering and helping us pioneer what is essentially um, new territory for so many of us. Some comments in chat I'll read before we end tonight. Do I think Bernstein influenced musicals more than Rogers or uh, Jerome Kern, George Gershwin? Yeah, no, these are all uh, influential figures. I would suggest that, um, you know, if you look at musical theater, um, we could draw a, a direct line between Bernstein and some of the, the more influential theater composers. Let me give you an example. Uh, Stephen Sondheim is, is arguably, after Leonard Bernstein, I would say, uh, one of the most iconic figures in the history and in the canon of uh, musical theater. Uh, those of you who know Sondheim, you might know Sunday in the Park with George or Follies or Into the Woods. Um, he's still alive, by the way. I think Stephen Sondheim's gotta be 91 or 92 years old now. One of the most prolific, um, Sweeney Todd, of course, uh, another one of his famous works. And, and he worked so closely with Bernstein. In fact, uh, the two of them worked uh, hand in glove on West Side Story where Sondheim wrote the lyrics. Um, and Stephen Sondheim, in turn, influenced Stephen Schwartz, who wrote Godspell and Pippin and Children of Eden and Wicked. So, um, yeah, I would say that Jerome Kern, George Gershwin, Cole Porter, they're, they're certainly influential figures. But for me, Bernstein um, has a special place in the canon. Um, Cynthia says, uh, yes, you can watch Hamilton on Disney+. Plus. It's wonderful. If you have access to Disney Plus, great. And if you don't have access, ask around. Your friends, uh, I'm sure someone will be happy to share a password with you. Those of you who have young children or, or grandkids, um, ask, because odds are, if you've got grandchildren, then your kids are shelling out for a Disney Plus uh, subscription. And Deb asks, uh, I missed the first two events. Is part one and part two available? I believe these events are being recorded on Zoom. So the answer, Deb, is I believe so, but you can ask the library about that. 
And Barbara says that Stephen Sondheim is in fact 90. Wow, 90 years old. He looks great. I saw a picture of him recently. And uh, gosh, we should all um, be, uh, be doing so well. He has an interesting uh, story, Stephen Sondheim. He grew up in Manhattan, Central Park, um, but had a really awful experience growing up. His, his relationship with his parents was not a good one. And um, if you want to read more about Stephen Sondheim, I'm uh, forgetting the name of the biography, but check out the library. You can do a, a search, um, look for biographies or books on Stephen Sondheim if you want to know more about that. Isn't this wonderful? We not only learn about musical theater and opera and all these other genres, but we wind up uh, encouraging people, I think, to read and go to the library. And uh, as a reminder, the Darien Library is open. Uh, there are some restrictions in place and you can find out more about that by contacting the staff. But, um, you know, check out your libraries. They're, they're wonderful places and the Darien Library is a very special uh, library. And that's not me blowing smoke. That's me just telling it like it is. Thank um, you so much, my pleasure, Susan, uh, it's really a pleasure. I look forward to seeing you next week. Excellent. All right. I will see everybody next week. Take care. Until then, stay well. And seven o'clock, only 167 hours to go. Bye bye now. Mm -hmm.